It's the 21st of February 2020, and in another 24 hours, it will be revealed that over 50 scientific journals have fallen victim to some of the largest scale research fraud in history. To understand what happened, let's have a look at this research paper. It may seem completely normal, but it is in fact 100% fabricated, with manipulated images, made up graphs, and texts that describe experiments which never took place. By the end of 2020, over 600 of these fake papers will have been accepted and published in scientific journals. And it's not an isolated incident. Over the past 20 years, there have been many other instances of journals falling victim to the exact same scam, totaling thousands of completely fake research papers. In this video, I want to examine the rise of what is essentially a black market where anybody, including you, can buy your way into becoming a researcher, with the caveat that it's of course all fake. Along the way, we'll discover how the market was created, figure out if any research or reading or hearing about in the media could have been faked like this, and most importantly, whether or not we'll be able to stop them. It all started with a post on the website Poppier, a forum where researchers post about scientific articles they have found that seem to contain errors, manipulated data, or straight-up fraud. On January 18, 2020, the user Indigo Farah made a post detailing these suspicious photos from a paper. They're called Western Bloods, and you don't have to understand them to see what's wrong. It's really hard to spot though, and requires some image enhancements. If you now focus not on the black bloods, but instead on the background, you'll be able to see that some of the noise pattern it repeats. This makes no sense as each section is meant to represent a unique experiment. It would be as likely as taking photos of different flowers and then realizing that the grass in the background was identical. In other words, a clear sign of image manipulation. A day later, Indigo would make another post. They had found a second paper from what was supposed to be completely different authors of different departments in different institutions that had the exact same type of repeating noise pattern in their article. At this point, Indigo's posts caught the attention of image forensics expert Elizabeth Bick. She works with discovering and exposing exactly this type of fraud. And where there are two suspiciously similar fake papers, there are likely more. So along with three other experts, she began searching for more examples. And it didn't take them long to find it. And with that, I mean literally hundreds of papers. Along the way, they also discovered that it wasn't only the Western blots that showed signs of manipulation. Almost all the papers had an eerily similar layout of their bar graphs, and many of the titles seemed to be generated using a template, something like this. Basically, choose your molecule and a verb, followed by one or two processes, a type of cell or cancer, your favorite connector word, another verb, and whatever molecule or pathway you prefer. And voila, you have yourself a title. I should say that similar plot design and titles in itself doesn't necessarily mean that anything is wrong, but together with the fake Western blots, it's clear that this had been done maliciously by the same group of people. All this happened in the span of only a month of investigation, and on the 21st of February 2020, Big made a blog post publicly announcing that they had found over 400 fake papers seeming to stem from the same source. Over the next year, that would increase to almost 650 in total, spanning over 50 scientific journals. Some of the largest scale research fraud in history. Interestingly, they also found that Indigo wasn't actually the first to discover this. Back in 2018, researcher Jana Christopher had published a paper detailing some manipulated images with identical backgrounds in a set of 12 papers that turned out to belong to the 650 found by Big and her team. But back then, it was never discovered that there was a bigger scheme going on. By the release of Jana's article, the perpetrators had published around 200 papers, meaning that hundreds of fake papers could have likely been avoided. But instead, the source just kept churning out papers for three more years. And it gets worse, because despite now having identified most of the fake papers, beginner team still had no idea who were behind it which might seem odd, as you'd normally just have a look at those papers to see who wrote them. But well, things might start making more sense if we actually have a closer look at those papers. You see, it turned out that most of them had completely unique authors, hundreds in total, with no indication they were working together. 
The similarities between papers meant that this was clearly the work of one group of people. So somehow the perpetrators were using other people to shield them. But what were the motivations to publish the papers and be if they get no credit? Well, to answer that, we'll need to travel to China. See, China is different from many other countries in one specific way, and that's publication pressure. Well, okay too, but we'll get to the second one later. When becoming a doctor in the West, you can generally choose between the patient and research path. But in China, even purely medical doctors will generally need to publish at least one if not a few research papers to receive promotions or even get a job in the first place. And here's the kicker, they rarely get any time off to do this but are just expected to somehow come up with the research in their free time. And with nearly 40% of Chinese doctors working more than 60 hours a week, it has understandably led some to look for alternative ways of getting this done. A known example of this consists of doctors handing over hard to obtain samples to researchers in exchange for an authorship title, a win-win for both parts. Except it's illegal and sometimes ethically questionable. So at some point someone got a bright idea. We don't know exactly when, but it's thought to have been in the early 2000s, somewhere in China, where one or more likely a group of researchers got the idea to start faking data in order to publish more research and increase its significance. Now, faking data is nothing new, but what they soon realized was that other researchers and later doctors had the same interests, so they started selling authorships on these papers online. Based on our current knowledge, the price can be anywhere as low as $700 to upwards of 30000 depending on the significance of the research, how prestigious of a journal they want to be featured in, and how much of the process is handled on their side. Over time, these researchers would form larger entities, eventually growing into what's thought to be as big as medium-sized companies, capable of much larger output, otherwise known as a paper mill. And that's pretty much how it works. So let's get back to Denmark. To summarize, throughout the last 20 years, a black market has formed where doctors, or really anyone who is willing to pay, can buy completely fake research papers. And they're responsible for thousands of fraudulent publications in hundreds of scientific journals. Now, returning to Bick's investigation of what we'll call the tadpole paper mill, due to the resemblance of the blots to these guys, they stopped publishing in late 2020. And since then, no one has been able to figure out who were behind it. The nature of a black market is to keep its sellers anonymous, which it seems they have successfully achieved. And it has only been helped by the Chinese government's willingness to just look the other way. When exposed, paper mills can easily lay low for a while and then just start up a new one, having learned from what got them exposed the last time. There are many more examples, some of which we're going to talk about. And it should be said that paper mills are by no means exclusive to China. Many have been identified in Russia, and smaller operations have also been found in places like Iran, Latvia, and many more. There are also different types of paper mills, in the sense that some of them are using only partially fake data, either by stealing it from others or producing photos and labs they have access to. There have also been cases where mills, especially in Russia, have simply translated real papers in their language into English and then published it as if it was new research. As well as paper mills that publish real research but just take payments to add other people as authors. But I'll tackle some of these in another video, so we can just focus on the ones that produce fake papers here. And about those, something just doesn't make sense. I mean, how are paper mills getting their papers into journals on the scale of hundreds without being discovered way sooner? I mean, some of these papers are in top journals. They must have some pretty serious review and safety measures before even considering to publish a paper. Or so you'd think. Meet Dr. Yoshitaka Fuji of Japan. In 1993, he would publish this paper, which later turned out to contain fabricated data. Two years later, he would do it again with this one as well as all these other fake papers. Years later, investigators would state about much of his work that it's as if someone sat at a desk and wrote a novel about a research idea. At the time though, it didn't get him exposed. In fact, it only helped make him a well-respected anesthesia researcher. But not everyone was fooled. By the year 2000, researchers Peter Kranke, Christian Apfel and others would write a letter to the Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia describing Fuji's results as incredibly nice, which may sound positive, but is more akin to a scientist's way of passive-aggressively stating that your results look too perfect to be real. 
but it didn't work as the journal refused to start an investigation. So the following year, Kranke and Apfel published a paper statistically showing that Fuji's results were off and then wrote a letter to the FDA, Japanese Society of Anesthesiologists and the Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices Agency voicing their concerns, for which they were completely ignored. Fuji would go on to fake many more papers until finally in 2010, where enough skepticism had built up that multiple investigations into his work were conducted, finally exposing his fraud. But not before he would take the world record in falsified papers, at least 172, 46 partially faked, 126 fully fabricated papers. Today, the total is at least 221. Nothing was done simply because at the time people began asking questions, he was too famous to answer the criticism. Well, okay, there's a few more factors, but point being that this is by no means a rare occurrence. There have been countless cases of scientists just making up data and getting away with it for years. Because even in the most prestigious journals, including Science and Nature, there are limited measures in place to identify if the research actually took place. Now, combine that with the sometimes less than ideal interest in exposing fake papers they themselves have published, and you have the perfect recipe for a whole lot of inaction. The identical backgrounds from the tadpole paper mill could have easily been identified if an image analysis tool like Image Twin had been used. Tools like these are both easy to use and have existed for a while, but it has only really been in the last few years that many journals have begun to utilize them. There are other ways though of catching those fake papers, because sometimes it's flawed logic that brings them down. One day, Elizabeth Bick was looking through a paper on prostate cancer and noticed something peculiar. Have a look here, it's to do with the patients in the trial. See anything weird? Well, almost half of them are women, which sounds very inclusive until you realize that females don't actually have a prostate. Another paper insisted that over half of the participants were men with ovarian cancer, and yet a third claimed that written informed consent was provided by all participants, even though they were exclusively infants and children, of which half were somehow above the age of 60. Unsurprisingly, these studies originate from a paper mill, totaling just over 230 papers so far, of which the majority were published in the European Review for Medical and Pharmacological Sciences. ERMPS for short, that just so happens to be within the top 20% of medical journals, according to their impact factor. Which is pretty worrying, so next let's get a better grip on how widespread this problem really is. Because the majority of paper mill customers are doctors, papers naturally trend towards medical subjects, but their by far favorite subfield is that of non-coding RNA. It's what allowed the tadpole paper mill to generate papers so easily, as all you have to do is basically just pretend to evaluate one compound's effects on a disease by measuring changes in another. There are literally thousands of compounds they can just swap between, giving them an endless pool of titles to pull from. ERMPS, the tadpole paper mill and many others operate almost exclusively in non-coding RNA for this reason. And it has led Big to state that any paper about non-coding RNA in cancer with office from hospitals in China is very suspect. No other field should be even close to as compromised, but our knowledge is limited. The ERMPS papers were easy to spot, but the tadpole papers, they required image enhancements and analyzing similarities between papers for the paper mill to eventually get exposed. And it's difficult to say how many paper mills put even more effort into their fakes and therefore haven't been found yet. An analysis of 53,000 papers tried to answer how many percent of submitted papers originate from paper mills. They found that for most journals, they make up 2% of submissions, but for some it's much higher, dragging up the average to 14%. Keeping that in mind, how many science and engineering papers do you think are published every year? Pause if you want to think about it. It's not 100,000 or even 500,000. It's actually 1 million papers, as of 1996. Fast forward to 2020 and it was 2.9 million. Include all types of publications and it increases to 4.68 million papers. Now, there will of course be more papers submitted than actually published, but if we ignore that and assume the 14% average from earlier is correct, that would place the yearly submission of paper mill articles at just over 650,000, which is staggeringly high and most likely inaccurate, 
I mean, it's based on only 53,000 papers, a mere 1.13% of yearly publications. But it's the best we have for now. Regardless, I hope it's stunning on you that the sheer scale of scientific publishing makes it difficult, if not next to impossible, to ensure that not even a minuscule number of paper mill papers sneak through the publishing filters. And speaking of inaccuracies, earlier I wasn't entirely correct in stating the paper mill started 20 years ago, as the origin is actually much older, and I think we can learn a thing or two from examining where they really came from. In terms of the term paper mill, it turns out to trace back to the term term paper mill. Here's how. As far back as probably the mid to late 1800s, student clubs at universities were known to store old members' assignments in the basement of their clubhouses, so-called paper reservoirs. Other students could then take inspiration or straight up copy from those files. In the 1940s New York, this practice would inspire tutoring businesses to expand on their services to struggling students. In his 1971 article about them, Leonard Stavisky describes how they began advertising ghostwritten dissertations, theses and term papers, as well as full-on research papers in some cases. And so, the term paper mill was born. Some of them would even openly advertise their services in newspapers. And besides a few scandals, this was largely ignored by institutions and local governments throughout the 40s, 50s and 60s. So if you had the money, you could pretty much get away with having others write your assignments for you. That is, until the arrival of the company Term Papers Unlimited. They would begin to advertise their ghostwriting services on campus in New York, which massively increased the demand. It's estimated that around 10,000 ghostwritten papers were produced for students in just that one year alone. But in December 1971, the Term Paper Mills would begin a year-long fight to stay alive as New York was fighting back. It started with the draft of a study bill that basically banned any direct assistance of students with their assignments. On February 11, 1972, a big conference was held at Hunter College to spread awareness and support for the bill. And it worked, with considerable backing from both the academic community, press and attorney general. The state assembly approved the measure in April, and in early May, the Senate did the same allowing Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller to sign in the bill just a month later, making New York the first state to ban term paper mills. And they weren't done. Parallel to this, State Attorney General Louis J. Lefkowitz had fought to put the five leading term paper mills in front of the Supreme Court of New York to stop them from just migrating to other states. It had already been approved back in February, and the trial was to proceed in June. And so, a three-month battle ensued with the term paper mills fighting for their lives. And in October, the final judgment was announced. The offending companies were ordered to be dissolved, and the defendants permanently enjoined from engaging in term paper mill operations again. They were officially done. Many aspects of the fight against term paper mills have been repeated in the modern paper mills, both in the way the mills operate and in how the problem was ignored for too long. The website Retraction Watch has catalogued over 2,000 retracted papers connected to paper mills, with the earliest Chinese example being from June 2007. Yet the Wikipedia article for paper mills was created less than three years ago in March 2021, which seems quite late. The fight against paper mills really began in the early 2010s, with one of the first investigations being China's publication bazaar by Science from 2013. Since then, a lot of individuals have been at the forefront of fighting the mills, using their free time to find and report fraudulent papers on platforms like Poppia, that are then collected and reported on by sites like Retraction Watch. Occasionally, organizations and newspapers will report on cases, but what we really need are some larger centralized bodies to take action. So let's cope with the Committee on Publication Ethics. Together with STM, they released a report on paper mills in 2022 outlining many of the aspects we've talked about. The study from earlier also came from this report. It's bodies like these that can change the standards of how journals operate, which is long overdue for combating paper mills. Things like requiring that researchers submit the raw data from their study, pushing the use of image analysis tools, and in general educating staff and reviewers on paper mills. 
Oh, and back in April this year, STM actually just released a program that aims to identify if papers should run through it originate from a paper mill. If steps like these are implemented properly, it should be possible to largely eliminate the type of fake papers being submitted today, just like we did with the term paper mills. Because we did stop them for good, right? In 2018, the company It Your Birdie ran an ad campaign on YouTube involving around 250 creators. It was pretty successful, racking up more than 700 million views. That is, until it was all taken down. More than 1400 videos after an investigation by the BBC. That may sound a little too familiar, because Itubirdy provides a service where students pay to get help in academic related tasks. The line between what is just good tutoring and cheating can be quite muddy, but this is not one of those cases. As is evident from their own website's transparent statements like get a plagiarism free essay in just a few clicks, with a selection of essay writers right below. There are many companies like it offering basically the same service as the old school term paper mills. It may come as a surprise, but these kinds of services have not been strictly illegal in many places. Even so, there will likely be consequences if you're discovered to have been using one as a student. Things are changing though. Just last year, the UK went ahead and banned this kind of business for good. Ireland, New Zealand and Australia have done the same, and other countries will likely follow suit in the future. But if we've learned anything from the past, it's that these kind of bans are difficult to enforce. In all likelihood, we should not expect the problem of paper mills to simply be solved. More focused efforts will surely reduce it, but as long as there's money and a demand, it will likely continue to be a phenomenon in scientific publishing that has to be managed. And in doing so, it's important we do not misplace the blame. Most are familiar with the stereotype of Asian parents wanting their kids to become doctors. But that has largely changed. Besides being overworked, around 60% of Chinese doctors are paid less than $14,000 a year. And it's not hard to find examples of some earning $700, $600 or even $500 or less a month. Many hospitals in China have also had to install airport-like security scanners on entrance to stop patients from bringing in weapons to hurt their doctor. Don't get me wrong, there are some areas where doctors are thriving, but many more where it's a tough and unforgiving job. So if you're picturing the customers of Chinese paper mills like this, you might have to dial that back a bit. How much the circumstances justify the actions of paper mill customers, I'll leave for you to decide. What I will say is that I suspect the phenomenon of paper mills can also partially be solved simply by putting people in better situations. And right now, the Chinese government could change the laws so that publications aren't an essential part of finishing your degree, getting promotions or a job for doctors. Back in 2020, they did away with a policy of monetarily rewarding researchers who get into Western journals. These are the cash incentives I mentioned earlier, and they have been driving up cheating ever since their introduction in the early 1990s. And while we don't have a clear picture of it yet, removing these have likely reduced the falsification of data significantly, because incentives drive people to cheat. And not only out of greed, but especially in the case of struggling Chinese doctors, because many feel their hand is being forced. Thanks for watching, and before you go, have a look at these images. They're from highly influential research into Alzheimer's and stem cells. And they also just so happen to have been faked. But can you spot how? In part two of this series, I'm gonna teach you not only how scientists cheat, but also how professional image detectives spot it, and how you can too. It'll be right here once it's uploaded. And until then, you can watch my last video. To Denmark. Did it cover? One more. Now faking, I did too early, gap, and one last one.